Welcome to the Vine Resources Podcast Show. Welcome to another edition of the Vine Resources Podcast Show. Uh, my name is David Lawrence. I'm delighted today to be in the offices of Glint, and I'm with the with the founder and the CEO, Jason Cousins. Jason, thanks so much for joining me. That's great. Thank We're, you for inviting me on the show. Well, and thanks for showing us your amazing offices in the T Building. Here in Shoreditch, in the heart of London, it's a fascinating building, and uh, I'm sure it's exciting for your team to be here. Yeah, it's a it's a really um, vibing area. People love the area and the different restaurants and bars and vents that go on around us. So yeah, it's a hive of activity. Can we, Jason, I'd love to know a little bit more about you and the company. Glint mm. is such an amazing company. There's so much talk about the company in the marketplace, in the news. Can you share us a little bit of insight for our listeners, please? Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm not from the financial sector at all. I'm, I was qualified as an architect back in the day and um, from there went into uh, 3D computer graphics and virtual reality. Mm-hmm. Some of the first things I did was visualising the Sydney Olympic Stadium and mm-hmm. Wembley Stadium before they were built uh, or the St George's Ch- Chapel at the, at the Queen's uh, ha- residence at Windsor when that burnt down, showing the, everybody what this complicated vaulted ceiling had looked like. So I was in the virtual reality game before the first time it was trendy, not the second. And, um, and that led naturally on to people wanting to have presentations in multimedia and in, on the web. And then we had to start developing websites and yeah. then e-commerce sites and of course back then systems didn't exist for um, e-commerce you couldn't get an off-the-shelf e-commerce store so we had to build all our own technology in fact what we were doing was looking at this emerging emerging digital landscape and saying well what can we do with this so it was a wonderful time actually before there were any kind of um, best practices of what, what you do we actually had to look at the opportunity and say what can we do with with this thing called the internet what is the opportunity around digital to be able to improve efficiencies or improve sales uh, or do things differently that never been done before. Yeah. And um, that's where I was for a while, developing e-commerce solutions for people, high street retailers yeah. like JD Sports or developing solutions for European manufacturers like Weidmuller. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then the financial crisis came along. And suddenly, for the first time, I'm seeing people queuing outside Northern Rock Bank yeah. near where I used to live up in the northeast. And I'm thinking, wow, that really shocked me, you know, because yeah. I had seen that before when I lived in Hong Kong for a while as a student. As I was leaving um, Hong Kong to travel on the trans siberian Railway back to home, I saw a bank, a, a run on a bank. Yeah. I didn't know what it was at the time, and I found out later. But to see that in your own hometown is really quite shocking. And that got me to questioning, well, what is money? What is a bank? You know, I didn't realize that a bank <laughs> is not a safe deposit of my money. Yes. That's how I perceived it. Yeah. I thought it was a safe deposit. It's not. You put my, I put my money in the bank. The bank, that money ceases to be mine. Yeah. That bank then has a liability to me. They then go and put it at risk. Mm-hmm. They then lend it out to people. And mm-hmm. most people are quite happy with that normally because they're getting a yield, mm-hmm. an interest rate on for, for that risk. But I didn't understand that. I don't think most people did understand it until the financial crisis. I think they did see it as a safe deposit. And suddenly there's a growing realisation that actually it's not. Mm -hmm. That the only way you can get a yield on something is if you're putting it at risk. And the second thing was that money depreciates in ways that are totally out of my control. You know, a pound bought me at least four chocolate bars, I'm sure, when I was younger. And now it only buys me one, and that chocolate bar is smaller. And of course, the financial industry are really great at coming up with words, fancy words like shrinkflation, they call that, mm-hmm. you know. But people, again, you know, it's not really, they're not really that conscious of it. But your money is depreciating ways that are far out of your control because of central bank policies and things like that. And so, for instance, the pound has lost 98% of its value, I think, its purchasing power mm-hmm. since in the last hundred years, so as the US dollar. All fiat currency, all paper money, has, um, has, it goes to zero eventually. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, again, my mind was thinking, what's the solution to this? There's got to be a better way. Um, it made me think about, well, what is, what is money itself? You know, if I'm lucky enough for you to do some work for me, then I owe you one. And that I owe you, uh, that promise that I have for you, is what I think money should be. It should be the ledger of people's promises with each other. And they shouldn't be, should, certainly shouldn't be corruptible. Mm-hmm. You know, that ledger should be sacrosanct. Mm-hmm. Um, and the problem is with, with money is that I think that anything where the nature of that store of promises that we have between each other, if that nature is defined by human beings and managed by human beings, then 
it's subject to corruption. Mm -hmm. So whether it is a fiat currency that's managed by a central bank, or even if it is a cryptocurrency which is mm -hmm. directed by a group of different people, they are subject to corruption. You know, mm -hmm. um, central banks can create more money, and they can therefore debase the currency. Cryptocurrencies can change; they can be forked, etc. And I sat there thinking, well, what's the solution? Of course, the solution was staring me in the face all the time. I didn't know too much about it when I first looked at it, but it was gold. Mm -hmm. Gold is the proven, longest, most reliable store of value that man has ever had. And we've had it for 5,000 years. And everybody inherently knows that. But deep down, they understand it's valued anywhere I go in the world as well. If I go to India or Tokyo or the US, mm -hmm. you pull gold out, people know it's valuable. They know it's a good store of value. Yeah. And it also, apart from any time in history as well, so even when there's conflict and as well. In fact, when there is conflict or when there's trouble, gold becomes the currency of last resort, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But it's stuck in a vault normally, mm -hmm. and it's not a very good medium of exchange. So it's a great store of value, but not a great medium of exchange. So I kind of thought, well, again, why, why can't it be used as money? People would say to me, I have... I have maybe 5, 10 or even 20% of my portfolio in gold, but it's stuck in a vault and I can't use it. Yeah. Uh, I can't use it to buy a coffee. And that's really what got me going because I'd spent the last 15, 20 years thinking, how do we do it differently? And I think it's important for pe people to be asking those kind of questions. And that's what led me to looking at how the financial system worked, how the payment system worked. And what we've done effectively is built cutting edge um, banking and payments technology that can combined with gold allows gold to be used as money in every day, every sense of the word, how you understand it. You know, you can buy the coffee downstairs. Wherever you travel in the world, we can use it as long as it's MasterCard's accepted. Now you can have your gold safely in a vault, but you can buy those hotels and whatever you want to buy, what product or service you can now use for the first time ever gold to be able to do that. The world's most reliable form of money now. Jason, if I wasn't um, very technically astute and I, I didn't necessarily know a lot about Glint and how to, how, to, how to use it or how to use that kind of technology, mm -hmm. how would you explain it in a few simple terms, what, what Glint actually does and, and how it can help people? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I think the two, two of the main things that it helps people with in their lives is uh, reducing um, the systemic risk for mm -hmm. them, so that if there's a financial crisis, they're protecting themselves from that by using Glint. And also they're protecting themselves from the destructive effects of inflation as well. But it's very easy to use. We've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that's the case and easy for everybody to be able to use it. Um, so where there's a very close product market fit with, for instance, people who have money, savings, mm -hmm. um, there is also a product market fit for people who have philosophically believed in an independent form of money. So we have to address both of those markets and they can be across numerous age groups as well. But um, for instance, uh, all you have to do is download the Glint app from the iOS or the uh, Google Play Store. Mm -hmm. uh, once you've done that, you go through a very quick registration process It doesn't take long and just a few minutes and most people get uh, authorized straight away. At that point they can uh, open their app mm -hmm. and um, they can deposit some money through into, into this account via uh, bank transfer or card payment. Mm -hmm. Glint is actually a multi-currency account actually. It's a multi-currency account that has pounds, euros and dollars in as well as for the first time ever being able to have gold in a multi-currency account as well. Amazing. Because as part of trying to bring fairness to everybody, we also believe that people shouldn't get ripped off when they, when they exchange between pounds and euros when they go on holiday or between pounds and dollars if they need to make mm -hmm. a payment abroad. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want people to be charged for, uh, you know, 5% sometimes people are charged when they go to airports and for things sure. like that. So you can exchange between all these currencies for only half a percent. And you can also, of course, buy gold on the platform as well. And it's really easy to use, easy to be able to transfer through any of these currencies. We then send you, of course, um, uh, a Glint card. Yeah. And um, with that, you can select uh, on your app which currency, that, that, which account that app card is actually going to use. Mm -hmm. So most of the time I have mine set to gold. But if I wanted to, for instance, use my euros or pounds, I could simply select uh, I want to use my euro account Correct. and whatever whatever euros I've got in there I can spend straight away. But one thing I think some people need to understand is that um, if they're using their gold as money, for instance, 
They don't need to sell their gold first. Mm -hmm. They don't need to work out how much gold am I going to spend this week, sell it into pounds, and then spend those pounds when, they, when they've done that. You know? mm -hmm. The problem with that, of course, is that you can only spend whatever you've converted. Yeah. With Glint, and when you, and when you convert it, it's, then, it's a it's systemic risk because it's now a pound, and what happens if the euro collapses or anything like that? Mm -hmm. So um, with, with Glint, when you, when you buy your gold, it's real physical gold. It's held in a very secure, highly secure, and insured vault in Switzerland run by a company called Brinks, who are one of the world's, or are the world's biggest independent uh, mm -hmm. vaulting company. It's outside of the banking system, and uh, it stays as gold, until the moment of transaction. So mm -hmm. if you go to uh, wherever you go to spend your, make your transaction, whether it's a product or service that you're buying, as soon as you use your card, within 200 milliseconds, we authorize and, and sell just enough gold in that moment to be able to cover the invoice of the merchant. Got it. So whether you're in New York or Tokyo, we'll mm -hmm. make that transaction for you. And just, just to be clear, with that card, it's almost like using a multi-card. So, so yes. as you said there, it, it, it's almost turning it into a four, four cards in it for one if it was euros, dollars, pounds, and, yeah. and gold. Yeah, that's right. Which is amazing. Yeah, so it's great for people who travel. It's great yeah. for people doing business in different parts of the world. Fantastic. It's great for people who want to hedge their savings into different currencies. Before we thank you for explaining that. Before we jump into what a typical day in the business looks like mm. for you as the business owner, you've obviously been through quite an exciting period. Obviously through a raise um, in terms of investment. Can you yeah. can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it's been an interesting journey actually. I mean, because Glint's had to build its own uh, technology. We've mm -hmm. had to build our own effective banking wallet payments platform, mm -hmm. and um, that's been no mean feat. Um, we couldn't just go to some of the off-the-shelf system providers and say we wanted a multi-currency platform because none of them, of course, enabled gold to be able to use as money. Mm -hmm. So we had to go through the discipline of building that ourselves. And on that journey, we've had to actually have a number of different raises. Um, we raised £3 million back in uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. We raised £4.5 million at the end of 2017. Mm -hmm. And we're currently in the middle of a Series A um, round of fifteen million pounds, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, I can tell you, there's all kinds of um, interesting things about these different raises. I think one of the first things really is that we haven't really gone well. We haven't gone to any venture capital companies so far. Yeah, and I kind of do question whether or not uh, the word venture should be used with British VCs because I don't really see them as venture capital companies. I see them very much more as growth capital companies. If you've got all your metrics right, you know, if, if all the KPIs, everything in your business is working, it just needs scaling, mm -hmm. then they're great. They'll, they'll invest a lot of money into your business and, and see it go forward. But if it's a zero to one business, because I see those other businesses often as, you know, making a lot of the challenger banks, for instance, are making incremental improvements to an existing product. Mm -hmm. So a better customer experience, for yeah. instance. Is it really, are they doing anything that's fundamentally different? I don't think so, not, not with most of them. What we're doing at Glint is completely new. It hasn't been able to be done before to be able to use gold and electronic payments mm -hmm. before. In fact, we've not really been using gold since we came off the gold standard and the convertibility of dollars and pounds from gold ceased to exist. So it's a real, for me, zero to one business. It's never happened before. And so the analysts inside venture capital companies have got to ask themselves the question, am I going to be brave enough to you know, take a bet on this company yeah. uh, for something that I can't measure against anything else? Very difficult for them to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I think in the United States it's slightly different, you know, but I do know that I hear that some companies had some challenges, you know, Airbnb raising money apparently mm -hmm. at the beginning, a lot of people said, no, well, you're joking, you're kidding me, you think that someone's going to rent a bedroom out in their house to a stranger, you know, go away. And so people always, when they're having, often when they're doing that, are up against those kind of challenges. What we did instead is we went to high net worth individuals, individuals who run their own businesses or, you know, who, who are able to make their own decisions who don't need to be reporting to a boss or anything about you know, what happens if this investment goes wrong. They can make that decision themselves. Often in a situation where they, off, they have wealth and they want to be careful about losing it. So they've been asking some of the same questions that I was mm -hmm. asking when we developed the product. And so the first two rounds we raised from mainly um, 100 high net worth individuals. Not all super high net worth. I mean, some of them were, uh, yes, people from the financial world, but others were just people who were generally interested in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. There was two exceptions to that. Um, we managed to attract uh, the interest of NEC, the Japanese IT business, multi, a multinational business that some of your listeners might have heard of before. 
and uh, also the Tokyo Commodities Exchange. And uh, that was a real coup for us because uh, the Tokyo Commodities Exchange had never invested in the business before. That's not their core business, in fact. And they're also made up of a number of different brokers. And so for the investment to happen, quite a large committee of people needed to be convinced. But what they saw with Glint is that we weren't just going to take market share within the gold space. We're actually going to build market share. We're going to make gold available to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to drastically increase the size of the gold market. Uh, and bring it front of mind again. So we came to our, we launched the business, we launched the company to people because we've been in stealth for such a long time. We launched the business to people in November t uh, 20th, 2017. Uh, and we're really pleased about, and quite honored really, to get the kind of uh, interest we got from the press. Yeah. So we were featured uh, across the spectrum really in tech and uh, mainstream media. Um, and, um, and then we started onboarding clients in at the end of February. Um, but the Series A, um, we looked at it and we thought, okay, we want to raise £15 million, but also if our mantra is that we should be bringing everybody an equal opportunity to prosper, and if we believe that Glint's an awesome business and is going to do really well and meet in a real need, then we should allow everybody to be able to benefit from that. So we opened it up through a crowdfunding with Crowdcube, mm -hmm. and uh, we targeted £1.25 million. Pounds. Um, which we thought was going to be quite a stretch because that's quite a lot of money to ask individuals to be able to come up with, especially for a brand like Glint, which you know wasn't particularly well known. It hadn't; it only been going a few months. But we smashed our target within the first seventy-two hours. We were really pleased to reach one point two five million, and the interest was just staggering and really flattering. And uh, the interest as well inside the forum, mm -hmm. um, the Crowdcube forum. Crowdcube said to us that it was the most engaged. Crowdcube um, program that they've ever experienced. The number of questions and engagement we're getting from the Crowdcube audience was 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 um, it was actually quite uh, a challenge to us. We had a lot of questions to answer, but we did. And it's wonderful now to see, even as people ask questions, or I mean, the Crowdcube finished, um, but. Um, to see people engaging in that and other investors answering people's questions before we had a chance mm. to answer them. I thought that was the highlight for me for the whole, for the whole program. But it, it ended uh, last week actually and we re ended up raising over two million pounds. So that's been a wonderful success. Um, and so um, people are back from the summer holidays now um, and uh, we're talking to people now about the rest of the money that we want to raise. And, um, that's really all about funding our growth into outside of the UK mm -hmm. because um, for instance we're launching into the US next month we've got some fantastic uh, distribution partnerships and we know there's a very strong cohort of people out there who have similar thoughts to us and there's a very strong product market fit so we're very excited about that. Fantastic thank you for that. Jason tell us a little bit about what a typical day in the business looks like for you right now well, it's changed quite a lot uh, recently. Um, my partner and I um, uh, have now have a beautiful new baby boy. He's Congratulations. Only, thank you. He's only um, five months old. Bless him. Fantastic. Has he got uh, a Glint card already? He, he doesn't yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, he has to be 18 to have one of those. But I've opened uh, my own special account for him and uh, we're saving up for, for his future. Um, the future calls on me that I'm sure I'm going to have for whatever he wants to do in his life. Um, um, but uh, yeah, so my life's changed a bit. So in the mornings, actually, I help out um, his mum, mm -hmm. looking after him, because mm -hmm. he's quite a handful. And, um, and I get into the office actually a bit later than I normally would. And most of my day really is about um, being an ambassador for the business. So going out and speaking to potential partners or, or funders, investors, about either this current round or just mm -hmm. putting ourselves on the radar about what we might need later. Um, it's about... Um, and a lot of it about the team as well, w walking and talking with the team and making mm -hmm. sure they're happy and uh, answering, any, answer, asking them if there's anything I can do to help them with yeah. their job. So I'd say, you know, um, ambassador in terms of uh, clients, um, investor community, partnership community, the, the wider talent pool, because we want to attract great people to Glint and our own team within the business. What, um, you know, this is probably, a, you know, it's a very exciting time in the business with a, with a global outreach mm -hmm. as well, but I'm sure there's, there may be someone that's had some impact on you as a leader. Um, is, there, is there anyone perhaps that's been a mentor to you or had an impact to you on your, on, on your life so far and, and perhaps why do, they, why do they have that impact? 
I, th I feel very lucky to have had some amazing people in my life and continue to have some great people in my life that give, always give me advice. And I think that's something that I've always... Some, actually, one of the greatest bit of advice I've always had is get great advice. You know, be open to ideas and thoughts and share your problems mm -hmm. and challenges and, and ideas with other people. So I've never been frightened to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we currently have a fantastic board of directors, for instance, and a, and a kind of wider... Um, group of people that are helping us with Glint. But I think the two people, which uh, if they're listening, I'd like to say thank you, really. First of all, is a chap called Jeffrey Lippman, who, uh, especially in my early part of my life, was a great influence on me. In fact, he helped me set up my first company, Visuality, when I was about, came out of university in my early 20s. And, and he was a great contrarian. He was a great devil's advocate. So he taught me about contrarian thought and devil's advocateship. In fact, I always had to try and work out whether or not what he was talking about was just for the sake of being the devil's advocate or actually made sense. Um, but it, that was great. And, and, and also um, recently, actually, a chap called James Booth. Um, James uh, has a company called Scooter. They're in advertising technology. James has already been a very successful entrepreneur and built up his own startup originally, which he ended up sell, selling to Google. He's been very generous with his time and ideas, and, and actually isn't the amount of time he spends, but because he's a very busy person himself, but it's been able to pick up the phone to him and just say, you know, what do you think about this or that, and he give me five, five or ten minutes of his time has been invaluable. Fantastic. Now, employee engagement is obviously very, very important in any company and organisation. I'm just curious to know, to share with our listeners, what are you doing within the organisation from the top to really engage your employees? Well, people and talent are equally important for us in our business strategy alongside things like the brand and our technology. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a very uh, structured talent and people strategy that we're developing as part of our wider business strategy, and it's a really key pillar of everything that we're doing. Um, one of the things that I can do is, for instance, with our team, is just walk and talk and be very open to them. You know, I have a completely open door policy. In fact, I don't have a door. In fact, I don't even have a desk at the moment. With that, with that, we've grown that much, and I spend try and spend a lot of my time um, going for a coffee, going for lunch with people, having meetings with people, asking them if there's anything that we can do to make their job better. Um, and I think that works. That's fantastic. And what do you think is the biggest challenge facing business leaders today? Well, I think, the, I think the number one challenge that business leaders have to address on a daily basis is keeping the company on mission. Mm -hmm. You know, as I said before, our, our vision is to give everyone an equal opportunity to prosper. And our mission is to bring a reliable form of money to the world. It's very easy, and especially in a startup where you're growing tremendously fast and you have some really challenging dates and goals to achieve in the short term, that you might lose track of that overall mission. So being able to reinforce that, I think, is one thing. And the other, certainly the one that we face, and I'm sure other people who are in exciting areas face as well, is the prioritization of opportunities. There are so many opportunities with Clint. Mm -hmm. The biggest danger is that we don't pick, prioritize the right ones to go with. How does um, someone who comes into the new the organisation? How do they understand the culture of the company from mm -hmm. from day one, or, 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 or perhaps even before? Yeah, well, I think um, when I was listening to another podcast, um, I did hear a story about one of the most successful uh, online businesses that uh, the founder had interviewed directly. I think the first six hundred people that had joined the business, and that's certainly the way we are at the moment with Glint. Is that every person joining the company gets interviewed by one of by either myself or my co-founder Ben Davies, um, who I'm very fortunate to work with. And um, I think that means that there's no interpretation, there's no veil through, or there's no, uh, through which the mission comes and the culture of the company comes. It comes directly from us. Yeah. I think the challenge and what we're addressing at the moment is how you productize that. So we're working on, for instance, uh, talent portals and videos, uh, not just talks from ourselves, but also now the team. The team, we've got 50 great talented people out there, mm -hmm. and it's about their opinions and how the, the culture is starting to develop a, a, in, a, in a wider area now. Fair. Fantastic. And what you know, if there was a perhaps a mistake that you you or, or you witness leaders making more frequently than others, what have you seen in your past? That's a really easy one. Micromanagement. I mean, you know, I don't think I need to say much more than that. <laughs> and if there was perhaps a behaviour or a trait that you've seen derail a leader's career, what would it be? 
I think that one of the challenges for leaders is to um, live both the future vision of the business mm -hmm. and be in the present at the same time. And as you go through the different um, stages of the business, um, at the beginning you have to be a total visionary and you have to totally live the future vision because um, there's plenty of people around you telling you you can't do it or you won't be allowed to do it. Um, there's lots of problems that you have to go through. There's lots of pain that you have to go through. And so the way you insulate yourself, or certainly the way I did it, was just to live in that future of success that, that, we already, that I was imagining. Yeah. But as the business starts to evolve, you need to somehow keep living in that vision and keeping that moving it forward, but also live in the present. And so you actually need to start feeling those pains. Yeah. How do you marry the two? I think one of the secrets is to have a pretty great group of people around you as well that can help um, help you with that. Absolutely. Jason, how do you see this industry changing over the next few years uh, as one question? And, and then how do you think that will affect your ability to attract and retain the right talent for you? So banking and payments are going through huge disruption. Mm -hmm. It is, we, it is going to look completely different to what we have now in, in about five or six years' time. And we're going to need totally different types of people in the business. I mean, already, you know, our, the makeup of our company is very different, I think, from a traditional bank. So you've got to look at what kind of people do you need in the business going forward mm -hmm. and how you're going to attract them. And, and I don't have all the answers for that. You know, we're working on it. We've got a great talent team. Um, I think about transparency and openness is really important and being really clear about the mission and vision for the business. Fantastic. And look, as a final question, Jason, if you had your time again mm -hmm. and you were giving your 20-year-old self advice, what would you say to yourself? So given the time machine, go back and say something, try and change who I am. I well, not change who you are, but if just looking back on it now and thinking if you gave, if you, if from all your wisdom and knowledge mm -hmm. and life right. experience, what, what, what may you, where you tell yourself if you were, if you were giving some advice? Well, I, I, I do struggle with this question because I think if I did give myself some advice and more importantly, I listened to that advice because <laughs> certainly my older children do not listen to anything I say, um, I think it would change me. You know, I, for instance, one of the things I've said to people is, uh, to myself, is I wonder what would have happened if I'd gone and worked for somebody else when I was younger. I mean, from the, leaving university, I've never worked for anybody else before, ever before. And one of the challenges around that is that I've always had to learn from my own mistakes. And I sometimes wonder if I'd gone to work for somebody else, would I have seen the processes already set up and just gone and made a few shortcuts? I mean, that's one thing I, I think maybe I might have said, and I do say that to my older kids, you know, so you should go and work for somebody, you know. But they've got this entrepreneurial bug in their, in their blood. But, um, but then that would have changed me. And I think my character and where I've got to has come through a lot of the, ch the troubles and the challenges I've had through my life. And I'm not sure that... Being able to shortcut those through good advice would have led to a better Jason. Totally understand. Jason, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate your time. I know you're extremely busy, but it's an exciting time for the business and I wish you the best. Thank you very much.